The only way out is in. What is the purpose of religion or spiritual practice? It, part of it is to get familiar with this function exists in every human being, this capacity to rest into this larger being held, this larger field. It's accessible to each one of us, but it's only available if we allow some of the activity in the living room of the mind consciousness to, to settle down so that the deeper knowings of the store consciousness have space to arise in the living room. If we keep our living room always occupied, phone, television, radio, virtual reality now, so many things to distract us, right? If our living room is constantly occupied, there isn't space for things to circulate from store consciousness. So all these things. They're, in store consciousness, there is way more than meets the eye to human experience. I often use the image of an iceberg, that you see about 10% of an iceberg above water and 90% is submerged. And that's how we are. Like only 10% of what's happening in us is really visible or able to be known by our usual ways of knowing. But there's this whole other 90% that is happening underneath the surface. And any spiritual path, any religion, spirituality, whatever you call it, a path to growing your heart and mind, it is essential, especially in this time where we are confronted with challenges no other generations of humans have encountered. It's essential to do that work of making that 90% visible or tangible or, or known because the reason we're in this trouble is because that 90% that isn't known has been driving us the harmful parts of it, the unconscious, the knotted, caught parts of our psyche, not just our individual but our collective psyche are what has brought us to this precipice as a species. And so this work is the most important work to get out of all the external situations of challenge of climate change and racism and war. And the only way out is in is because until we untie those knots in ourselves, we won't be able to untie them in our world. And, and that's what the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, it's our mind that creates our reality. The only reason we have things happening the way they are in the world is because those exist in our minds. It's with our minds that we create the world. This is how it goes. And so any path, any path that takes us beneath the surface is what we need. I say this to my Buddhist communities all the time. You can't be a real spiritual practitioner, if you're not looking at race, how race works in this world, if you're not looking at gender, if you're not looking at all the ways we hold privilege or identities that impact other people that we can be very unconscious of, that's our work. That's part of our spiritual work is to wake up to these places where we've been asleep, where our society has led us to be asleep. So all of that is part of being someone who actually can offer something in this world. But we, we do keep working to grow our hearts as big as we can, to keep learning from our mistakes, to keep growing our love, nourishing the wholesome seeds. And doing that actually is what helps us not be so attached to what other people think of us. If we cultivate our wholesome seeds. If every day we wake up and say, I want to cultivate something beautiful in me, because all the beautiful things already exist in each of us, just as all the horrible things do. If we make a choice every day, I'm going to cultivate my generosity today. I'm going to cultivate gratitude today. I'm going to cultivate forgiveness today. I'm going to cultivate clear mindedness today. Acceptance, openness. If we do that every day, we have enough of a source in ourselves of our own goodness that when we make a mistake, someone blames us. We say, okay, I learned from that. 
I move on. But we have this understanding of our own capacity to bring beauty into the world, to nourish other people, to nourish ourselves. But that's why we have to practice every day to nourish these wholesome seeds in our store consciousness. Because then when these winds inevitably whip the waters up, we know that there's something below the waves. Our goodness, all the things we've been cultivating, you know, those can carry us through the toughest of times. You can't be a real sincere, authentic practitioner in your own tradition if you're not somewhat in touch with the wisdom of other traditions. Like at this day and age, that's just not, that doesn't work anymore. And the way I talk about it, and Adam Bucko actually shared this teaching with me from Father Bede Griffiths, which also resonates with me and I've heard in, in many other places, but this sense of the palm of the hand is where uh, all the wisdoms of all the ages and all the cultures and countries and places, that's one. And the fingers are the different pathways to that uh, common mystery and understanding and ability to actually live well in this world, in these bodies. We can do that. And these different paths try to take us there, but they're all going to the same place, so there's not like a different endpoint. And they're all coming from the same place. They're just expressing themselves in different ways. There is real relevance to these different paths. And I also see that we are at a time in, in our history collectively where we can't be over here. <laughs> you know, we have to be making the journey to the, to the common places because that's also what's gotten us into trouble is this, I have the path, I have the way, my tradition, my whatever is, but there's this need, there's this real need to synthesize, bring together, not try to merge, but there is a need to be much more aware. In the Buddhist way of seeing, everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone has this capacity to be much more than we think we are. And other traditions speak about the same thing different language. Adam has really been drawn into the mystical traditions of Christianity, which sounds so much and feels so much like what I've been exposed to in Buddhism and also in other Eastern practices of Hinduism or Taoism. There's this ability to just cut through the surface layers and the, the veils that keep us from seeing things as they are and this immediacy of connecting with life. Like this, some of the things I've read, there's this koan-like expressiveness from different mystics. One thing is I'm just so in awe of the huge, vast territory of Christianity that I didn't really know about growing up Christian. Like, I didn't study it very formally, uh, even though I practiced it. And there's so much of the Bible I never read, and we, we do Lexio Divina together often in the mornings. And so there's pieces of the Bible I'm like, Jesus said that? <laughs> and it's so radical, it's so profound, it's, I get chills. So one part is just like I'm covering more ground in Christianity than I ever did. <laughs> I remember picking up the Bible and reading as like a teenager. There was a lot that I didn't read and a lot that I didn't understand. So we'll take a piece of one little reading and we'll talk about it in the light of what's going on in our lives. And it's extremely applicable. There's always something in there that we can really look at how it addresses our life, how we want to move towards something bigger or, or more in line with how we want to live. So it motivates it, it inspires. And then with the mystical traditions specifically, one of the things he shared with me about is the dark night of the soul, which I've encountered wonderful teachings about in Buddhism in terms of inherent kernel of everything else. It is like you need to be aware of suffering and know how to care for suffering. And that is a part of life like that. That is the path is like suffering is there. And then how do you 
How do you learn from that so that you don't recreate it unnecessarily? And how do you live with it as gracefully as you can when you can't avoid it? But this understanding in the dark night of the soul that there are these moments in our lives that really serve to to temper us, to strengthen us, if we know how to move through them, if we know how to honor what they're here to teach us, not like trying to take on more suffering. (laughs) But when it's there and you can't avoid it, then how do you really live into that? This image of the burning log, that the things in you that need to get transformed and consumed by this fire, they get consumed and the fire becomes this real beautiful manifestation. It's not life attacking you. There really is this opportunity for transformation that you can choose to be a part of and move with. And then you really become an offering. Your life becomes an offering if you choose to accept that. I'm not explaining it as beautifully as, as, it, as it's explained in the teachings, but that image really, it resonates so much with some of the deepest teachings I've experienced and, and tried to practice in Buddhism in terms of if you can be able to look suffering in the eye, you're good. You don't have a whole lot to worry about. (laughs) That's why we all suffer because we can't do that. We can't accept what is there. But if we can do that, just look it in the eye, okay, I have tools, I have ways. And it's not that we're always gonna be prepared or know what to do, but this general attitude of the mind that This is part of life, and I am going to move with this. It's different. And then, okay, how do we move with that? How do I be present to really see all the different things that are going on in that moment? Those are some of the places where I've gotten really so much respect for the kind of hidden teachings of Christianity that aren't necessarily in the mainstream. It's just, to me, quite phenomenal that the language is so similar and the insights are so similar and I resonate with them. We read together, he and I, people who have done a lot of work in both kind of landscapes, so a Dominican friar who came and studied with Thay Thich Nhat Hanh and wrote a book about Meister Eckhart and Thich Nhat Hanh being his two main teachers or a couple where man is a Buddhist Roshi, the woman's a Catholic, you know, and they're writing about the rosary and their common practice of the rosary as a Buddhist Christian couple. As we delve into these other folks that are doing this amazing work of being in dialogue, there's just so much. And it's also like one tradition kind of needs the other to bring out certain things. It's like only from this perspective are you able to nourish that thing. But if you're in it, if you're in that framework, you won't see that special seed that needs to be watered. But if you're not in that framework, you can help, the other tradition can help aspects to grow and to express themselves more beautifully, more fully, more clearly through the engagement. And it's not just Christianity and Buddhism, but all traditions that can shape and enrich each other in that way. These deeper questions can't be resolved at the level of the mind, but must be entrusted to a different, deeper part of our consciousness. Tai suggests we consider this big question as a seed, plant it in the soil of our mind, and let it rest there. Our mindfulness practice in our daily lives is the sunshine and water that the seed needs to sprout so that one day it will rise up on its own in its own time. We ask our deeper consciousness to take care of it and let go of our thinking and worrying about it. This part of our mind is called store consciousness. This is a a Buddhist psychology perspective that's not 
so unlike other Western or psychological, neurological understandings of our consciousness. There's the background consciousness language in other traditions, but it's this understanding that there is a part of our activity of, of mind that's always operating. It's storing memories and impressions, it's consolidating things so that they, they can be brought up and used in other situations. It's the integrating of our experience that happens when we dream, for instance, or even it's what helps us get from point A to point B when we know the route and our mind is somewhere totally elsewhere, but we still get to the right place because that's our store consciousness that knows, oh, you turn right here and then you go left there. And when we're on a route that we know, that's not our mind consciousness that's getting us there. We're not actually thinking. It's, it's this other part of ourself. We talk about being on automatic pilot, but in some ways it's very helpful that we don't have to use because the mind consciousness uses a lot more juice, <laughs> uses a lot more brain sugar than the store consciousness. The store consciousness is this very efficient, much more effective than the mind consciousness. To walk, you can't think your way, with your mind consciousness, you can't do all the different millions of micro things that happen to move your foot, <laughs> not fall over. That's your store consciousness that's doing all these things in your body that if you tried to think it through, you would just, your brain would blow up. <laughs> so many things like that happen throughout the day. Our mind consciousness could never keep track of, but the store consciousness can handle just fine. So there's lots that we don't need to think about, thank goodness, right? We can learn to entrust, to take refuge in this part of ourself that is so capable and knows how to do what it does. But our mind consciousness can work with our store consciousness in a helpful way to be conscious about, oh, here you are, you have this function, I have this function, the things I can't take care of, let me invite you to help me take care of, or things that are too big for me. Instead of what often happens when we can encounter a difficulty is our mind runs itself ragged trying to figure things out. That if we would just let go of for a little bit, so many like scientists have talked about their big discoveries coming when they were in the shower, when they were on a walk, not when they were in the lab, not when they were working that formula. And so it's the same with, uh, with anybody. When we're really tight, when there's a lot that we're trying to figure out relaxing, letting go of the difficulty or the question, giving more space, leaning back rather than reaching in to kind of leaning forward. All of that gives a lot more possibility to access the wisdom that's already in us. We, we all have incredible wisdom in us, not just from our own lives, but it's Store consciousness contains all of our ancestral wisdom too. It's why babies are afraid of snakes when they've never seen a snake before. That's the collective consciousness that's in the collective store consciousness. So there's the individual store consciousness, there's the collective store consciousness. So we can rely on it, not just from our own experiences, but from all the experiences of all generations. We have access to that. We're hooked up <laughs> to the big network. And so, so when we, when we stop trying to figure it out, me, as my little self, and we let ourselves release, and all of this good stuff that's under there can find us and sprout up without any effort. And suddenly we have the words that we needed, or we have the idea that we needed, or something just comes together, or we just see it in this other way. But it doesn't come from trying so hard and wearing ourselves out. But that's how we're taught. We're taught to keep trying. If it didn't work this way, do it that way. Until we're exhausted and burnt out and we have no creativity, no juice left. We have to stay juicy for these, <laughs> for the beautiful things to come, come forth. And that means stopping. It means letting go. It means relaxing. It means 
being more lazy, being more pliant, and seeing the many possibilities in a situation where we get stuck is when we think, oh, it has to be this way. That's how it will be resolved. It has to be this way. We don't see the whole picture most of the time. And if we come into this place where store consciousness can operate, store consciousness sees many possibilities. When we open to this other wisdom, it's like help can come from so many different directions. If we are receptive, part of what's important with store consciousness is letting mind consciousness fade to the background a little bit so we can be more receptive with this deeper part of our consciousness. That's why when we turn over this question in the form of a seed to store consciousness, store consciousness will take care of that. It will do its work. It is soil. If soil will grow a seed if it's fertile soil and our store consciousness is fertile soil. So it's part of it is the letting go, it's the trusting. We have things that are blocks of suffering that need to be circulated so they can heal. But we also have incredible wisdom that needs to circulate so that it can be realized and become part of us, become part of our mind consciousness, our waking, interacting understanding. It's like mind consciousness needs to know that store consciousness is there. That's one of the functions of the spiritual practice or a psychological path. And then know, start to understand how it works so mind consciousness can work with it to give space to store consciousness to offer what it has to offer us, which is to help us integrate and heal these things, these blocks of suffering that are things from our childhood, things from our parents, from our ancestors that are still in our consciousness, intergenerational trauma, but also intergenerational resilience. All that's in our store consciousness. It's held down there. So quieting the mind, honing the mind, refining the mind so that we can, like a laser, we can be precise to, to bring our attention to one aspect of ourselves, that allows the store consciousness to really help us with both healing and with realizing these deeper truths, deeper awarenesses that can really liberate us. We really need to befriend store consciousness. What happens is people get afraid of it because the monsters are down there right? When, when we have demons, when we have monsters, unhealed parts of ourselves, they come up in our dreams, they come up in a flashback, they come up in some compulsive behavior. We're like, how did I end up doing that? What took me over and made me do that, say that, eat that? <laughs> so then we think store consciousness is our enemy. And so then we want to make a blockade where store consciousness can't communicate with mind consciousness. So then we drink alcohol, we have addictions, we, we escape. We fill up our mind consciousness, the living room, 100% of the time so nothing can break through from store consciousness. Because there are things down there that scare us that we don't think we can handle. And that's one definition of trauma is something happened and we didn't have the means to hold it, to be with it. People around us didn't know how to help us. The trauma is the response to the original suffering, not the original suffering itself. It's because we didn't have the capacity to be with it that we get traumatized. So that's what's down there in store consciousness, these things that we couldn't be with that harmed us or we were harmed by. So mind consciousness can begin to make this journey of saying, hey, there are tools, there are practices, there is a path that can help make it a little bit safer one day at a time for little bits of these scary parts to come up. 
And if my mind is present, not filled with all these other things, then I can see this part of me that I've been afraid of and see it as suffering and hold it with kindness, with tenderness, just a little bit at a time. And then it goes back to store consciousness less intense, less scary, because I've had a tiny bit of an encounter with it. And so that's the spiritual practice, is to be on a, on a path of working with store consciousness so that these parts that are unintegrated can little by little become integrated, where we feel safe with ourselves, where we learn, okay, there's this block in me, everyone has blocks in them, I'm not bad or wrong. These are things that I need to learn to integrate and become friends with. So we learn to not be afraid of what store consciousness can bring up. Even in a dream, that is a field that we learn we can actually cultivate. We can water wholesome seeds that live in store consciousness, that are resting in store consciousness. Every day, we can listen to things that nourish the best in us, that encourage a broader mindset of opening our hearts to people and things that are different from us, of caring about people's suffering, of bringing joy to ourselves and to others, of remaining balanced and still even in the midst of all the storminess. All those seeds are there in our store consciousness and with our mind consciousness, we can think of it like being a gardener. Mind consciousness can water the wholesome seeds in store consciousness and help care for the seeds of suffering in store consciousness, not suppressing them, not allowing them to take over, but this middle path of taking good care of them, learning about them, befriending them, loving them so that they transform. That's how mind consciousness can really care for the being this good gardener to the soil, to the storehouse of store consciousness. A cat falls out of a tree, becomes completely relaxed. It is the philosophy of the Tao that the moment we were born, we were kicked off a precipice and we're falling, and there is nothing that can stop it. So instead of living in a state of chronic tension and clinging to all sorts of things that are actually falling with us because the whole world is impermanent, be like a cat. when things inevitably do their thing, right? We're always falling. <laughs> then you can enjoy the ride. You also can give other people a lot more freedom and space to be who they are. And then it's much nicer to be around you <laughs> when you're not defining people as one moment in their life or even a whole collective. Seeing ourselves as beloved is seeing how we belong to every other thing and that every other thing belongs to us and how do we want to be in a relationship of care to all those things. I have a friend who's a midwife or was a midwife and she talks about with women in labor shifting from the idea of a contraction which encourages the mind to tense up and bear down and instead to think of it as a surge actually it's not a contraction it's it's the uterus doing this it's not going like this it's actually trying to push the baby out but thinking of it as a surge and just even that difference in how you think about something and how women then can experience that quite painful experience with more openness, with more spaciousness, and even enjoy this incredible process of giving birth. That's just one example that I find helpful in terms of if we meet the difficulties of our life with this contraction mindset, oh, it's going to be painful, this could be terrible, and yes, it could be, 
But if we see the, the losses, the ways life just impacts us and pulls the rug out from under us as a surge, sometimes if I can't sleep, doing some kind of loving kindness practice that includes myself, but where I begin to wish others in my life well, wish people I don't know well, wish people that are difficult for me well, wish all beings well. Let's talk about the heart. When I put my hands over my heart in bed if I can't sleep and I'm just focusing on may everyone that I know that I don't know be happy, be healthy, may they have a good sleep. That helps me go back to sleep. It helps me to really relax because I'm knowing my connection with all of these. It's a non-self practice to see more and more that what happens to me is interconnected with everyone. What happens to them, it impacts me. And so caring about them, really intending for their well-being energetically, that's a heart practice that is a not-self practice. And when I can break out of this, oh, I can't sleep, and what's going to happen tomorrow, and how am I going to make it through the day, then I slip into this beloved place of, I can wish people well, I can wish myself well, I can stay connected to my heart. The heart is where all the worries and the fear resides also, so that fear transforms into love, into care, into compassion. So that's the disidentifying, right? Okay, here I am, and I don't need to make a story about this that is more painful. There's just so much wisdom in our body, just like in our store consciousness. It hasn't been appreciated in most of the ways most people have been trained <laughs> to live in the world. Is not in touch with the incredible wisdom of the body. And that includes when you say things like, I, f I knew it in my gut, I had a gut feeling. <laughs> Our gut has neurons. <laughs> it is real. Our body is not just our brain that knows things. Our heart has neurons. All these phrases that we've come up with in our different languages, they are really accurate. When we practice, a spiritual path, the only vehicle we have to practice that is, is a body. There has been in Christianity and Buddhism both and other traditions as well a kind of a veering into this uh, dualism between body and mind and a, a negation of the body as being not spiritual which is connected to patriarchy, the f feminine body being earthbound and this energy of transcendence of getting away from all the material <laughs> realities of babies and poop and <laughs> blood and <laughs> feeding and, and cleaning and the sense that, that spirituality is about purity and you won't have the full experience <laughs> if you're trying to get out of your body because there is so much that only through being in the body that can be really experienced and known. What I'm interested in more now, but what I'm seeing in many places is a much bigger respect and turning towards how do we really be in our bodies? How do we listen to our bodies? Let our bodies lead the way. Right? So when I'm working with someone, for example, in mentoring, in a spiritual kind of directing fashion, a lot of times we cannot move through something through words alone. If they're struggling with something, something's arising, it's when we start to go into the body where I'll say, well, where do you feel this in your body? Or what is this showing up like? When we start to be with emotions in the body, 
then something can shift. And so then we bring, if it's tightness in the throat or this tension behind the eyes or this heaviness, this darkness in the belly, then, okay, bringing, bringing awareness to that, bringing space, letting that have space, letting that be there. What does that need? What would that like from you? So be, then we can be in dialogue with it. We can begin to care for it. And then always, whatever it needs, it's very understandable. There's the ability to relate to that with compassion. With this shift, rather than this pain that's doing something to me that I want to get rid of, it becomes, there's this part of me that needs attention, that I can actually attend to. When we go into our bodies, we bring online the part of ourself that has access to much more facility if we're not feeling what's happening in our body and we're sort of from here up, we actually don't have access to the part of ourself that can care for ourself. We have to go below the neck <laughs> to access that. That lives in these other centers. I've been studying more with Raja Selvam. He did somatic experiencing but then created a a slightly different path of in integral somatic psychology where it's all about connecting with emotions in the body and also been studying with Resma Menachem who does somatic abolitionism looking at um, you know all the ways trauma lives in the body and how do you really notice not just the physical body but all the things that the body picks up on your vibes the vibes you get from a situation, the memories, the impulses, the moods, the sensing. Maybe it's tingling in your hands, or maybe it's your hips wanting to move, or maybe it's you're wanting to hum and express. All these different folks that I'm finding are bringing an element I didn't have much awareness of that really allow a lot more circulation to happen. I was talking earlier about circulation between mind and store. You have to be in the body for those things to circulate, right? It's like if you are carrying a 50-pound bag with one hand, it's, it's really hard. But if you hold it in both hands, you carry it with your whole body, you can do that. And so what's so wise about bringing this attention into the body is you get to bring more of yourself to the task. If you can spread what you're feeling around, which is counterintuitive because you don't, if it's painful, if it hurts, if it's unfamiliar, scary, you don't want it to get bigger. But actually if it gets bigger, if more parts of your body can hold it, it becomes more diffuse, it becomes easier to hold. So giving it space, allowing things to circulate, allowing things to express, we have a tendency to shut ourselves down a lot of the time, to not express certain things. There's only certain things you can do in daily life that are acceptable. Right? You can't just start humming and swaying, you know, in the middle of a dinner with people, right? So there are all these ways that our body wants to move and knows how to move or, or express itself to allow things to release. This is interplay, this exformation, these practices that the body has in all cultures that are so natural but that certain cultures have really shut down. Being embodied helps us to even feel that we want that. There's so many things we don't even know our body wants until we take the time to feel and notice that we have a body. <laughs> this has been helpful for me when people have offered this to me as a practice and I've offered it to others, they found it helpful too. If they're stuck between a couple of different choices and they don't know what to do and they're cogitating about, well, if I do this, what about this? Well, what if I go this way? When you picture yourself doing this, option, how does it feel in your body? And when you picture yourself doing that, how does it feel in your body? And usually people know right away. When they just get into their body, 
they know what one thing feels like and what another thing feels like. And one usually feels quite different <laughs> physically, bodily. So that's body wisdom. That's the power of the body to say, hey, this is what I know to be true. The mind, we can go in many circles and, and pros and cons and what about if this happens? But the body is just like, nope. <laughs> but that's a skill also to be developed is to tap into that power. Ty has a book called The Sun, My Heart, where he talks about we have our personal heart, but we also have an external heart. If our heart stops beating, we will die. But if the sun stops, we'll die. Not only is the heart also the mind, but the heart isn't just the heart beating in our chest. That's another, this sense of the boundlessness of the heart. We rely on all these other things to keep us alive, just like our heart. So also not only identifying our physical heart as our heart, but the sun, the moon, the stars, the planet. <laughs> One thing that's interesting, just etymology language-wise, is that mind, what's translated as mind in English from Asian languages from Chinese, for example, is actually, in Chinese, it's the character is mind-heart. It's both. We don't have that concept that your mind is your mind and your heart, <laughs> that it's both, that the mind is the heart. The heart is the center of vast intelligence, wisdom, random thought, but we have this dog. She <laughs> She's all black except for this white streak down her chest. And I've been noticing how common that is in animals, in horses. This always, why is it right here in the chest, right? I don't know, I can't imagine that that's a coincidence, but the four Brahma Viharas in Buddhism, four elements of true love, loving kindness, friendliness, compassion, joy, equanimity, or inclusiveness, these four faces of love, they're said to be immeasurable. You can grow them without limit. You can become boundlessly loving and friendly, boundlessly compassionate, boundlessly joyful, limitlessly equanimous. And I love that framing because it's like your heart, your heart. We can grow our hearts so that there is no boundary anywhere. So that there's no, nothing that is left out of our hearts. That's what I want. <laughs> good, good, good work. That's what my good. heart wants. <laughs> When we're identified with our thoughts, with our worries, that's the separate self. That's us thinking, I am this, these, what we say in Buddhism, five skandhas, five aggregates. I am this body, I'm these feelings, I'm these perceptions, I'm these mental formations, my emotions, I'm my consciousness. These are the five aggregates that make up a human. And so I was just thinking about this this morning because someone wrote to me saying exactly this quote, what, are you, what does that mean, that the beloved, when we see ourselves as beloved, that is not self, but if we see ourselves as victim, that's a separate self. An answer came to me, I woke up anxious about all the things that need to be taken care of for this wedding, and then I lay down and did a, a meditation, and my mind consciousness began to settle, and I began to touch into this deeper layer that's always right there, right under, when you release some of the mind. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's what it is. That's how I can answer her. When we don't identify with the five aggregates, 
and we begin to touch into this consciousness which holds that but isn't only that. So as I just began to kind of relax and settle and not be so focused on what I was afraid of, I touched into feeling loved. I touched into feeling okay as I am without all these things figured out. Like I touched into this other place of being able to rest and feeling happy. And that is the not-self <laughs> experience of, I don't have to worry about all these things. I do have things I have to figure out as the day goes on, but in this moment, I can actually just be here and life is going to unfold. So it's not washing your hands of life and saying, I'm just going to sit this one out. But it's this, here I am in the midst of all of this and I can just notice what's happening. The not-self is about allowing yourself to touch into the ways that we already are held and belong to this larger stream. And that stream will just carry us. And we can swim, we can make things happen in that stream, but we don't have to make the whole stream flow. That's when we get caught in our little self. It's like, I have to make all these things happen. Where we are identifying with who we are, what we want, and all of those things have a place, but they get us into trouble when we attach to them. One of the teachings in Buddhism is of seeing impermanence, seeing that things are constantly changing. That really helps us if we can notice how things are changing to not get attached to this is who I am because tomorrow I'm going to be different. <laughs> Yesterday already I was different. And if we can see that, then we can flow with this unfolding and notice like, you can't step ever in the same river twice. You can't step into the river of you twice. It's even said the five aggregates are rivers that flow, always, constantly changing, constantly having new feelings, different perceptions, different mental formations. So we don't want to identify with, I mean, how can we? If we really are paying attention, it's like the stream is flowing so fast. How can you say, this is me, right here is me? Well, so that's not you that just went, and that's not you that's coming. There, if you just stop trying to say, this is me, and you just notice <laughs> what's been, what's here, what's coming next, then you're much more in touch with how things actually are. Then it's not so difficult to let things go when they need to be let go of. And when you change, when people around you change, when life changes, when your life circumstances change, if you're not invested in the story of who you are in any given moment, then you're quite free. In Buddhist temples, you find a common symbol of a wheel with eight spokes with a hole in the center for the axle. The eight spokes represent the Noble Eightfold Path taught by the Buddha. While living in Sri Lanka, I was offered an additional meaning of this symbol. The eight spokes represent the eight worldly winds. They are four pairs of opposites, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, and fame and disrepute. They are the four things we hope for and the four things we fear. The wheel of these eight winds is always turning. It never stops. It is the hole in the center of the wheel that holds the key. It is empty. From the center we can see all the eight worldly winds without being caught up in them. And that center is a reminder of our own emptiness, 
which gives us the ability to see ourselves as more than these eight worldly winds that come our way, to in fact see ourselves in everyone and everything and see everyone and everything in us. And what I like about this teaching of the eight worldly winds is that they are always changing. We can't get comfortable thinking, ah, oh, now I'm a popular person and this is how my life is going to be. And it's not about what other people think. It's about this empty space in the center of the wheel is this place of not being taken up and down by these winds. When you gain something, when you lose something, it's this ability to stay, okay, life has its ups and downs, but here I can still be okay regardless. I can go up with the ups, I can go down with the downs, but not lose myself in either of them. I can enjoy, I can grieve, I can be grateful when things come my way, I can release things and be okay with being disappointed when things don't go my way and know that it's all part of the journey. The key is we have to have a center inside of us that exists independently of what other people think of us, that we have to know. I think of people like Nelson Mandela in jail for 27 years or people who've been maligned or wrongly accused how do you, when everyone, maybe many, many people misunderstand you or have judged you or the opposite, if they've taken you to be something you're not in a positive sense, you have to be true to yourself. You have to know what's true about you and that is your guide. Nothing's wrong when bad things happen, <laughs> difficult things happen. That's part of how it works, just as good things come to us. So much of these things are not personal. War. It's not because all those people are bad that they're getting bombed. We can't take things personally. So that whole, that still quiet place in the middle of this ever-turning wheel is also about not taking all of that personally. Things are coming, things are going. We take the lessons we can take from our life. We let things go. We don't atta let them attach to a sense of a self. This mantra, you are partly right, is it's a helpful place of being able to stay centered, whatever comes our way. So whether it's praise, whether it's blame, criticism or appreciation, we take in the parts that are helpful and we don't have to take everything else. <laughs> So this has been a very helpful teaching for me. As someone who I think has been very concerned in my life with pleasing people, and that has a very deep root of wanting to feel safe, wanting to know I'm going to be taken care of, right? That's collective also, this human, who we lived in very small groups of people in the past. And if you did something that would make your group reject you, you wouldn't survive alone. I'm sure I'm like many other people, a, a lot of suffering arises if we feel people don't appreciate us or criticize us or blame us or judge us. There's times when this can be constructive and we really need to learn from what people are telling us and take it in. And we also need to be able to have a deep enough relationship with ourself and enough of an appreciation for ourself, like to really know our worth, that no matter what we've done, really, no matter what we've done, if we are on a path of healing, of, of forgiving ourselves, of making amends for our mistakes, we can fall down and we can stand up again and in ourselves we can know other people's judgments of us are not the full picture of who we are. It doesn't mean we don't take in the value in what they're saying to us because it can be very helpful. But often 
it, if it's shared with love, <laughs> it goes much further in terms of helping us. But it needs to be shared. The truth does need to be shared, even if it's painful. If, but if it helps us grow. So we want to be open to that. Sometimes people don't see our full picture and our worth. And if they are critical of us, we need to have something inside of us that can say, there may be some truth to what they're saying, but that's not the whole truth. We have many good things in us. And how do we n know that and stay balanced? Of course, the opposite is true as well. If people praise us a lot <laughs> and see a lot of our good qualities, that's wonderful. That probably a lot and that is accurate and we want to take that in and be receptive to that and allow that to nourish the wholesome seeds in us. But also not forget that there are still many parts in our garden that need to be cultivated. It's another reason why spiritual practice is so important because it's easy to get deceived even <laughs> in ourselves about who we are. And someone tells us something, we're like, well, that's not how I am. But maybe it is. So doing that kind of work to really see and understand who we are, how other people see us, but holding that up against how we see ourselves to get a clearer picture. Usually it's some combination of the two that gets us closest to reality. How we see ourselves, how other people see us. But all of our happiness and suffering can't accompany what other people... If our happiness is dependent on being praised and appreciated, there are going to be times in our lives where we're doing exactly what we need to be doing, but nobody is appreciating and praising us. That doesn't mean we should stop. So how do we have that fuel from within, saying, I know this is what I need to do. Nobody is appreciating, nobody's seeing it, but I know this is what I need to keep doing. Or we're doing something, everyone's blaming us for it and judging us, but I know this is what I need to be doing. I have to keep doing it. So something in us has to be able to be independent. Breathing in, I go back to the island within myself. There are beautiful trees within the island. There are clear streams of water. There are birds sunshine and fresh air. Breathing out, I feel safe. I enjoy going back to my island. My true home is anywhere there is practice. I have found, because Adam also has really been influenced by the monastic path in Christianity, in our ecumenical institute was very much grounded in this, you have a daily discipline of something, and you have a corporate communal practice, which is a daily every day, daily life thing. So having that as my <laughs> 0 to 14 context, and then 15 years in a monastery as a Buddhist nun, that kind of monastic and communal framework, that then he's really been influenced by the, the monastic elements in Christianity and Christian mysticism. That's really what we're both now wanting to head towards is a community that's both Buddhist and Christian in expression, but that has this practice element of a daily schedule and community and some kind of training, some kind of study, some kind of work, some kind of rest. A rhythm that allows folks to really drop into what is deeper than what's happening on the surface and to feel this body of people that is doing the same thing. It's not that everything I have received, I just take unquestioningly, like oh, I want to recreate. But 
but there is this, there are elements of this monastic commitment and discipline that I know, I just feel like it's so hard if you don't have that, <laughs> if you're trying to keep yourself spiritually afloat in this crazy world by yourself, you're just using most of your energy to just keep the main things going. So you only have a teeny bit of energy for your spiritual development. But if you're in a community, if you have this rhythm where you are forced to stop, basically, forced to stop, and let all the thinking of the mind kind of recede. At least that's not what you're, it's not motivating. You can't just jump up and do that next task that your mind tells you you have to do. You have to sit there. You just have to marinate. If you have that kind of consistency, you just have much more energy in your mind, your mind energy, to look at these deeper questions, which we really need to be looking at. Having come out of monastic life into this world and that moves so much faster, I really am just seeing like, wow, it's not that it's not possible to live a deep and spiritual life outside of a monastic context, it is. It's just, you have, the wind is blowing right in your face all the time. And with more people, and with the structure, with a little bit more of a, a membrane around you, because that's something I really experienced living in the monastery. I was behind a membrane. I wasn't as accessible personally. As a group, we were very accessible. But I didn't need to be accessible personally. I didn't need people to be able to call me. Or I was there showing up to eat, make beds, to do walking meditation with the community. So that's how I was needed and that's how I could offer. I had this protection against all of the ways life really, you know, inserts itself and, <laughs> and takes you away from what is always there under the surface, this kind of ability to rest in what is. What I really noticed when I left the monastery was, wow, I don't have any of that protection. I have to do everything. I have to do all the things that many people were doing in the monastery. And so much more energy is going more outward. I recognize that this is me personally. For other people, this more solitary or engaged life in the world, that's really what they need, or at different times in our life. But I see for the way I was raised and the way I've lived, the kind of way my mind easily gets scattered. <laughs> it's really helpful for me personally also to have a kind of structure and a kind of container that I'm not the only one responsible for <laughs> creating. When I look at my journey, living in community for most of my life until I was 40 basically, and even in college, I chose the most communal settings to live in. I have needed this time outside of community, residential community. And I, I really experienced this. I needed to individuate. I needed to see how much it cost me to, <laughs> to do all these things that were kind of just held in this larger field in the community. I think that was really important for me to grow up, actually, to be lonely. When I would sit there in my apartment in D.C. and eat by myself, which I had always had people around me pretty much to eat with, like that very basic thing of eating your meals like alone. I was like, you know, this is how a lot of people eat. A lot of people are very lonely. So all of that felt important for me to touch and to taste and to know. And also just to know I could take care of myself, just me in an apartment. <laughs> I could take care of myself financially, I could take care of myself socially, I could take care of myself spiritually. And I was still related to communities and teaching and engaging, but it was an important. I'm really glad my life has unfolded the way it's unfolded. And now in this partnership, like figuring out how do you live with another person? Okay, I figured out how to do this by myself, but now, now two paths have to blend and that's its own set of 
challenges and, and gifts and, and wonders. I can see both of us, because we both had this really strong monastic theme in our lives, we're both heading back there or, or wanting to kind of keep spiraling to, to that place of basically a more spiritually committed way of life where there are just certain things that aren't questioned. Both Adam and I feel like from the beginning of our relationship we were kind of guided, like the way we came together, it just felt like we were led to each other and the timing was so like exactly right, like (laughs) amazing. A few months before he reached out to me, he really started praying and saying, I really feel like I, to really complete my life now as a priest, I need a partner. And very soon we connected and a phase was finishing in my life that really allowed me then to be very, was like perfect timing for, for me to meet Adam. And as soon as we talked on our first Zoom call, I finished the call, it was two hours long. I was like, oh, this is the person. It was just a friendly call. We'd we'd never met, but we were just connecting as friends. And then, oh, this is the person. (laughs) And he had the same feeling. And with the next Zoom call, we were talking about me coming to New York. (laughs) So it was this immediate kind of recognition. And I say that because the first time we really took a vacation together, We went away to a friend's mountain house for a week and we just started talking about what do we each see in our future? What's our vision for where we want to go? And within 30 minutes, this thing, it felt like a download. It was like, oh, we want to be in an eco-village. We want to have a Buddhist Christian community. We want to grow food, to live in harmony and loving service and stewardship of of the earth. We want to have this a practice center where other people and us can practice together a daily schedule. But it was like, boom, like neither of us has had tension or questions or conflict. It was like, oh yeah, this is what we want. We hadn't really talked about it until that point at all. And then within 30 minutes, it was, oh, this is what we want. (laughs) It really felt like it just came to us, like we were being led. That was a year and a half ago, and it's still, so we started this community that meets every month now, a Buddhist Christian community of meditation and action. Every month we have a practice, there's, there's a talk, there's time for interacting, connection. We give some of the donations that come in go to children in Ukraine, a young man in Delhi who lived in the ashram for homeless people that Adam worked in and is now wanting, raising a family, needs a car to be a taxi driver. We're raising money for... The, anyway, so there's some action coming from that, but that's the little seed of whatever might come in the future of some kind of residential community. Maybe it's a training center and people start to join us, maybe families or couples or single people over time where people have their own livelihoods, but where we have some kind of common practice. And then people come for a certain period of time to get trained. And then this larger community can start to build out. Eventually, we've talked about wanting to have low-income housing, places for folks who, without a lot of money who can live and practice if they would like, that we would have our own little house, but that we'd have a common place like a meditation hall or chapel thing and then a dining area. and then, you know, Maybe a CSA is growing food on the land we're on or maybe there's like projects for permaculture or ecological green building designs and solar and wind and you know renewable energies it's a training place for that too where people from the local communities can get employment or training or something as part of what we're doing but that the heart of it is daily meditation prayer weekly 
coming together to share our insights, our appreciations, maybe a monthly silent desert day where we're fasting or time in silence, solo practice, prayer, things like that, where there's like a regular rhythm and a grounding in study, in practice, in being present for each other, being present for ourselves.